I decided to go to First Corinthians tonight because we're uh, we're about to start up Advent, which means for the next four weeks we're going to be kind of hitting thematic sermons rather than just working through the Book of Acts. And if I were to go through the Book of Acts tonight, I would have to dive into Stephen's speech with the um, with the Sanhedrin, and uh, I think it's with the Sanhedrin. Whoever, whoever ends up killing him, uh, Stephen's. Stephen's speech starts now in Acts chapter 6, and there's not really uh, a good, it, it would be wrong to start it and then take a four or five week break. So um, we're just going to do, I, I went back to an old sermon that I did back in New York on um, in, in 1 Corinthians on a topic that I think is always kind of relevant and helpful, and that is how do you discern the will of God for your life? And uh, I think there are some things that we can learn. And there's a really interesting situation in uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians in, in, when it comes to um, discerning God's will, or at least something that I think we can, we can draw some, some stuff from. So open up with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And uh, I'm going to start reading in verse 5. 1 Corinthians 16, starting in verse 5. And I'll give you a, I'll give you an overview of, of this little paragraph. It goes something like this. Paul has a clear plan in mind if the Lord permits it. Paul has an idea of what he wants to do if it's what the Lord wants to happen. So let's read this, 1 Corinthians 16.5. I will visit you, Corinthians, after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened for me, and there are many adversaries. Three things I want to point out just from, from this paragraph, your observations. The first is this. Paul, Paul intends to visit the Corinthians after he passes through Macedonia, but uh, until Pentecost, Pentecost, he's going to stay in Ephesus. So it, you have to kind of imagine a map here in your mind. It, if, you're, if you guys are looking at the map, so I'm going to do it from the back side of the map. Uh, let's say this is Israel, Mediterranean Sea. Over here would be Rome, the, or the, the modern-day Italy, the boot, right? And then right here on the north side of the Mediterranean Sea, is Corinth. And then there's a sea between Corinth and mm, modern day Turkey. They call the Aegean Sea. And uh, right on the other side of the sea is Ephesus. So Ephesus, Aegean Sea, Corinth. And north of Corinth is an area known as Macedonia. And what Paul is saying is here's what I want to do I want to travel up north, around the Aegean Sea, come through Macedonia, and then I'm going to spend some time with you in Corinth afterwards. That's his plan. Uh, so that's the first thing. I just, I just want, want you to kind of have a feel for what his intention is. I'm going to visit you after I pass through Macedonia, but for a little while I'm going to stay in Ephesus. The second observation here is that when Paul gets to Corinth, he intends to stay with the Corinthians for an extended period of time. Verse 6 says he, he says he, want to, he wants to spend the winter with them. And verse 7 says he doesn't want to just see them in passing. So this is, this is his plan. I want to go through Macedonia. I'm going to then park there for a while, maybe spend the winter. That's my, that's my plan. The third thing is that Paul understands that this is only going to happen if the Lord permits. He's aware of the fact that uh, his plan is subject to change. He uses some very careful language. He says in verse 6, uh, perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter. And verse 7, he says, I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Now, I'm going to come back to the situation in a moment, and we'll talk about what happens to Paul and his plans. But before we do that, I want you to see that there are two principles at work in Paul's life. And the first one is this. Paul knows that God's plans are supreme. Paul is aware of the fact that uh, the Lord establishes a man's steps. Uh, a man plans his way, 
Proverbs 16.9, the, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And Paul seems to know that this is uh, the truth, and uh, he knows that his vantage point only provides him a limited perspective, and he does not know for sure what lies ahead. And because of that, he's really careful about the way that he talks. He would make James very proud, because James, the brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James, James said, this is a pretty common passage, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is, e is evil. To think that you know for sure what's to come in your life and to speak as though you do is arrogance, James says. And so Paul is being, being careful not to be arrogant. He's guarding his words, even in the way that he's communicating his plans to the Corinthians, if the Lord permits. That's the kind of way that he uh, talks. Perhaps some of us need to learn how to submit our planning to the fact that God is sovereign and he is the one that ultimately determines what's going to happen in our lives. That's the first principle at work in Paul's life. It's pretty obvious to see that. Here's a second principle at work in this situation in Paul's life, and it's this. He's not afraid to make plans. E even though he realizes that God is sovereign, that God is the one who ultimately determines what will be, it doesn't paralyze Paul so that he's unafraid to make plans. Sometimes people become paralyzed in their decision making because they're afraid to make plans, knowing that God's plans are the ones that ultimately prevail. I've even had conversations with people uh, who believe, well, this was a specific situation. There was this guy who I was talking to at CSU back in the day who believed that it was sinful to become a student at CSU because how could you possibly follow the Spirit of God as he kind of blows and, and gives gives you the, the, these whims of, of, of new input each day if you're already committed to going to class each day? That's arrogant for you to sign up for something that commits you. How are you going to follow the Spirit? So what Paul is, what Paul is doing here is saying, that's a stupid way to think. Uh, that is not what God intends. Even though God is sovereign over all things, Paul still is willing to make plans. And he doesn't live a life that's void of reasonable decision making. In fact, much of the time, the way that God execute his, executes his plans is through the plans that uh, he sovereignly determines that we come up with. Does that make sense? God uses our own planning sometimes as the very means through which God then orchestrates what he is intending to do. That's how Paul's approaching his travel plans right here. He's just assessing the situation. Based upon what he can see, he makes plans. Um, just based on what seems most logical to him. He says, he says in verses 8 and 9, I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me. So, what's he doing? He's saying, look, I'm doing work in Ephesus. It's really fruitful right now. I think I'll just stay till Pentecost. Makes sense. Okay. It's a great example of how to live our lives, I think, in our day-to-day responsibilities when it comes to how do you discern the will of God, I think decision making by God-fearing humans who are making plans and yet who are consciously aware that God ultimately determines all things, I think that's generally um, how, how we ought to live our lives. I'm trying to just make the best sense of what I have to work with here, Lord. I think the Lord goes away to go. <laughs> good, good job. Um, I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Right? Those, those are the two principles right there. I have a plan, spend some time with you, I submit it ultimately to God's sovereignty. Does that make sense? Um, at this point you might be wondering, well, what happened to Paul's plans? And uh, here's what we know, is that for some reason they drastically change. Because when we get to 2 Corinthians, uh, we have a little more information about the situation between Paul and the Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, we discover that Paul ends up going directly to Corinth rather than going to Macedonia first. He doesn't go up and around and spend some time in Macedonia. He goes directly to Corinth. It seems that there was something urgent that took place, and it changes his agenda. He goes to the Corinthians. It does not go well. He doesn't end up spending a lot of time there. He leaves quickly, and he stays gone for a long time afterwards. There's a lot of tension between Paul and the church in Corinth. And, and the, the story is kind of played out in 2 Corinthians. turns out that there are some false apostles who've come into the church. Um, they're questioning Paul's apostleship. It's just a really bad situation. Things blow up in Corinth, and uh, 2 Corinthians kind of gives you the story. Now, I don't really want to park on that for the rest of our time. What sparks my interest is this question of what happened in Paul's life to make him uh, convinced that he needed to change his plans. And um, he has a plan. God apparently had a different plan, and God exercised his sovereignty, and in one way or another he convinced Paul, you need to change your plans because I've got something else in mind for you. Now, we have to be pretty clear here. There's no way to know how God stepped in exactly in Paul's life and changed his agenda here. Um, we don't know why it was convincing. We don't know what the circumstances were. Um, some people suggest, I, I'm not gonna go into this. Some people suggest that Paul sent Timothy to Corinth, which we know he did. He was supposed to get a report from the Corinthians, bring it back to Paul. Um, that probably happened, and it wasn't a good report, and so Paul went directly to Corinth. Um, and you can, Talk to me if you want more detail. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and you can see that Timothy was sent there. And, um, and, when, and then in um, 1 Corinthians 16, Paul also says, I have notes on this. 1 Corinthians 16, 10. Let no one despise Timothy. I'm sending this guy. Take good care of him. You can tell there's a tension in the air. Probably didn't go well. So Paul, probably, that's probably what happened. Anyways, we don't know those things for sure, but here's what we do know. We, we know that you and I can relate to the fact that we, as Christians, long for and need guidance from our Heavenly Father, especially when we're trying to make big decisions. Uh, should I change careers? Should I take this job? Um, should, I, should I go to school? Should I marry this woman? Um, should I make this investment? You know, we, we, we have these big decisions that we're trying to make, and um, that's, a, that's just a reality. We want to do what God wants us to do. Is it even possible to know that? Does, he, does God even have specific desires for us? I think he does. Um, uh, sometimes we make plans that are good and godly and logical, but those then get shifted around. We've all experienced that as well. Um, and we begin to wonder whether or not, um, you know, is, it, is this God, or is God trying to, like, show me to go on a different path or whatever? Most of us can relate to that kind of thing. So if you're hanging out with Paul at Ephesus, and he comes up to you and he says, hey, man, um, or hey, lady, <laughs> I, I, have, I was going to go to Ephesus, or I'm sorry, I was going to go to Corinth, and here was my plan. I was going to go up, spend some time in Macedonia, and then go down there, but some things have come up, and I'm, I'm thinking I should go straight there. What do you think? How would you counsel him? What, what, would, what would you do in a situation where somebody's coming to you and they're trying to figure out if God wants them to do something? What kind of advice w would you give? And I'm putting it in the kind of what if somebody asked advice of you, but maybe just put yourself into that situation. How would you process whether or not this is a decision that's from the Lord. What's God doing here? And what I'd like to do for the rest of our time today is talk about um, the various ways in which God moves in people's lives in order to help them understand what it is that he wants them to do. Or to put it another way, I want to talk about the ways in which God directs us or redirects us. That is to say, I want to understand how to track with the will of God when God's on the move. And what I'm going to do is share with you six biblical principles that I've accumulated and applied over the years um, that have been reliable guidance 
uh, for me as I try to discern if God is on the move. Please understand, I'm not saying this is how you create a crystal ball uh, for God. Uh, God is certainly not limited to these six things, but I think you'll find, um, especially with regards to really major decisions in your life, uh, that these things will help you keep your bearings. Some of them are somewhat subjective. Some of them are totally, I think, objective. And um, I think we'll be helped by these things. I want to also say, as, as a general rule, you should probably not rely on any one of these six things. Oftentimes, I think if guys on the move, um, that several of these things are hitting at the same time. And so um, we'll kind of point that out along the way. OK, so let's jump in. Um, Turn with me to Acts 16. Acts chapter 16. I want to show you a situation in which Paul was redirected by God. It's Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10. It's probably not always this clear, but... Um, Maybe we can learn some things from it. Acts 16, 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. You guys know where all these places are? Don't worry about it. I'll show you how to say. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia... They went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Okay, so here's the map again. Mediterranean Sea. Here's Israel. Here is Ephesus like modern-day Turkey, north side of the Mediterranean Sea. Here is Macedonia, across the Aegean Sea. Paul is traveling through modern-day Turkey. And he's not allowed to go into Asia, which is kind of down to the south side. And let's see, Holy Spirit had forbidden him to speak the word in <coughs> Asia. Um, Phrygia, Galatia, he, he's kind of being funneled right up to the very edge of um, the Aegean Sea. Wait, I'm sorry, your map and my map are backwards. He's going toward Ephesus, and he gets funneled, and finally, he decides he wants to go to, uh, he wants to go into Bithynia. And that means that as Paul is moving, kind of he's being funneled west, going toward the Aegean Sea, he's trying to go to Bithynia, he's trying to go east. He wants to go north and east, and the Holy Spirit won't let him. So he gets to Mysia, and then Mysia, from Mysia, they end up going down to Troas, and they're right on the shore. And, um, and then he has this dream of a man across the sea in Macedonia, a man to the west. Paul wants to take the gospel east. The Holy Spirit won't let it happen, funnels him to the edge of the sea, and then God gives him a dream, and Paul goes, ah, okay, I get it. I get it now. Now I understand why I was being forbidden from going here and here and here and here. I tried to go east. I tried to go north. I tried to go south. God just kept taking me west. It's because the gospel needs to go west to Macedonia. And from that point forward, in Christian history, the gospel went west. And that, it went toward Rome. I mean, this, this shifted the course of history. This moment right here is God's insurance that the gospel goes the direction that God wants the gospel to go. And, and even now, we're still trying to get the gospel east into the 1040 window. That's kind of the last frontier of missions work in many ways. Um, because the gospel didn't go east initially, and it's never really had a, a major um, uh, breakthrough in the 1040 window. What can we learn from knowing God's will? Here's the first principle. Sometimes God's guidance 
when God when you, God starts making things clear, sometimes God's guidance clears up loose ends. As Paul is uh, trying to make sense of what is happening, he's, he's trying to go to what makes the most sense to him. Take the gospel east. That makes the most sense to him. And it's leaving him, I'm sure, it's super frustrated and with a bunch of questions about what, why is God preventing me from succeeding in Galatia? Why is he preventing me from going northeast to uh, Phrygia? Phrygia? I don't know. Where, whatever was northeast. Bithynia. What's going on here? Uh, the, the, the more populated places were to the northeast. And God won't let it happen. We don't know how the Holy Spirit was opposing Paul's plans, but we do know that when he got to Troas, something happened that brought all the pieces together. And, and oftentimes, when God is giving you guidance towards something, it clears up some previously uh, some previous loose ends that were created. Things that maybe were even frustrating in your life for a season because you kept pushing and pushing toward what you thought God wanted, and it wasn't fruitful. And then, suddenly, Paul has this dream. A man in Macedonia says, come over and help us. And it's like the, it's the eureka moment for Paul. He said, oh, okay, now I know what to do. This totally makes sense. He buys a boat ticket and crosses the Aegean Sea and tells the missionary team, here's where we're going. Okay, so sometimes God's guidance ties up those things. Not always. Um, not always. Actually, sometimes when God provides guidance, it creates those things as well. So uh, I'm not saying this is the only the only way that it works. Sometimes God says, hey, here's what I want you to do. And it's clear that that's what we want you to do. But you have these huge question marks in your mind. It doesn't seem to make, make sense. But I think you'll find that often one of the ways that God indicates that he is, in fact, on the move in your life is by bringing ideas to mind that resolve loose ends. Um, I remember one night I was at Library Park here in Fort Collins, 1998, and I had been in Fort Collins for <clears throat> about a year, a little under a year. I don't know, maybe it's about a year at that point. And um, I had just gone through a really brutal breakup, and my life was a wreck. And I was thinking, what am I doing with my life? And then into my mind comes this thought, Jeremy, you should go to college. I was 18 years old, 19 years old, I should go to college. Um, in New Mexico, where you still have in-state residency. And I, for me, it like was like, what? I don't know why I never thought of this before. I'm 19 years old, you'd think I'd at least consider going to college before, but not really. And it made so much sense of so many things. It was just the right word at the right time. It, it cleared up all these these questions that I had about my future. I was like, I, I, I think this is the Lord. Um, and so that was an experience in my life where I, I saw this type of thing <coughs> happen. Does it make sense? Does it tie up loose ends? If so, it could be that God is providing some guidance. Here's a second principle. God's guidance is initiated by God. God's guidance is initiated by God. As you read through this passage in Acts 16, the decision to go to Macedonia is not initiated by Paul. In fact, you can go back and see that God is already putting a plan together that Paul can't make sense of for a long time. Paul is, is brought into the loop pretty late in the game after he's had a season of being pretty frustrated by the things that he thought he was supposed to be doing, or at least, at least they made the most sense to him. Um, so, uh, God was already on the move. God had already initiated the story. And um, by the time Paul understands what he needs to do, it's kind of like, um, well, he can't really take much credit for it because he was funneled into this position. Um, at the age of 20, as I began to realize that God was calling me into college, I could look back on previous years of my life and see that, oh yeah, I've been funneled to this point. And a lot of failures have happened, actually, that have brought me to this point. Um, this was a plan that was not my initiation, this was God's initiation. So you can see how these two things actually go together.
actually. These first two principles really work hand in hand. God initiates a plan, and then he orchestrates our lives in such a way that a story is unfolding. At some point, he provides us with some indication of what he wants us to do next, and suddenly it makes sense of all the loose ends that were uh, part of the earlier scenes in the story that didn't make sense to us at that point. And um, even though it didn't compute at that point, now God reveals something It makes sense of loose ends because there was a story that was initiated by God in the first place. Um, okay, so God's, God's guidance is often brings closure to loose ends, and it's, and it's, it's obviously initiated by God himself. Did I manipulate this? Am I coercing this situation? Am I the one who's, who's forcing my hand onto something new? Or did, did, did God kind of funnel me to this and then <coughs> provide me with an idea that uh, suddenly makes sense of everything? Here's a third principle. God's guidance often brings joyful peace to our soul. God's guidance often brings joyful peace to our soul. When God shepherds us, by providing direction for our lives, the Holy Spirit often provides a supernatural joyful calmness in the soul to go along with it. So take Psalm 23, for example. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me and your rod and staff, they comfort me. Here's a man being shepherded by God, guided by God, led by God, and it says he leads me, he's making me lie down, he uses a shepherding rod to direct me, he's with me, even as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And as a result of God's shepherding care and guidance, David says that he's experiencing the spiritual equivalent of green pastures and still waters, and his soul is restored. He's not afraid to walk through incredible trial. He's comforted by the uh, presence of the shepherd's rod and staff. David feels, um, or David rather, gives us imagery to describe how the soul feels when God is guiding you as his, as, as your shepherd. Right? This imagery is... Is a it, 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 relate, it, it corresponds to spiritual realities. What does it mean to be led beside still waters? It means God's leading you to peaceful places. Um, and so as we hear the promptings of God, His voice tends to provide some form, usually, of Holy Spirit-produced calmness that comforts us with a sense of His own powerful shepherding presence and and pleasant peace. And when I, when I say it's attended with peace, I don't mean that God is always guiding us into comfortable, peaceful situations. I will not fear even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So David's not saying the Lord leads me to peaceful situations. He leads me to peace, even in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. See, there's a calmness in the soul when the shepherd is truly guiding him. Um, so that's, a, I think, a question you could ask if you're wondering, is this God, is, is there any sense of peace? Is the Holy Spirit providing any sort of discernible testimony of his comforting presence as I consider the options that I'm contemplating? So to illustrate... <clears throat> We'll go back to Library Park. Here I am at Library Park at like 10 o'clock at night, trying to figure out what the heck to do with my life. And um, this idea comes to mind to go to college. It made sense of several loose ends in my life. Uh, it was clear that God was the initiator. I hadn't been planning on going to college, but all the things, everything kind of, as I thought through it, I thought this just makes so much sense. It lines up with a ton of things. And as I considered the option of going to school, and I saw that it made sense of the larger story that God had been working in my life, what do you think happened in my very troubled heart? Joy, peace, relief, a sense that like, oh, oh yeah, something clicked into place. 
And I, um, I, I would say that, that it was the Holy Spirit lifting burdens, lifting tensions, and giving me some sort of affirmation that, yes, this is in fact the Lord. So God's guidance often brings joyful peace to our soul. Now, those three things are pretty subjective. Um, does it tie up loose ends? You know, well, you're reading the situation and you're thinking, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And did God initiate this or did I initiate it? Well, it seems like God initiated it. And, um, and, then, and I, feel, I feel good about it. That's, that's, all, that's, pretty, that's pretty subjective. And some of you might be thinking, yeah, I, I know exactly what, what that's like. I've experienced the same kinds of things. It's so sweet to sense the guidance of God like that. And, um, and I totally agree. And in fact, I'd say there's almost nothing that is more powerful to motivate a person to obey uh, as being convinced that God is guiding you to do something that brings a lot of joyful peace to your heart. You know, it's hard, it's hard to talk a person out of something that's giving them a ton of joy, right? So I'm with you on that. But I, I think we need to make sure that there are more than these three things at work in our lives. Because those things are all very open to personal interpretation. Because they're super subjective, right? Um, you might think it makes sense in your life. Uh, but how do you know you're not just justifying a, a selfish de decision? You might think it's bringing you a great sense of the comforting presence of God's joy. But how do you know it just it's not just... That it sounds fun, you know. Oh yeah, this is going to be good. This, this will be good. I can, I can imagine that being God. I mean, I'd love to work at Disneyland. This sounds fun. Actually, that sounds terrible. <laughs> I would not be up for that. <laughs> oh no. So three more principles. Number four here. These ones are a little more objective. God provides reliable guidance through His Word. God provides reliable guidance through His Word. The Bible is the most reliable source of revelation. You can't go wrong if you go biblical. You cannot go wrong in terms of following the lead of God if you go biblical. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, and you can bank on it, right? Um, if you want to know what God wants you to do, make sure that you're seeking his voice in his word. And the benefits of doing this can be stated both negatively and positively. Negative, negatively speaking, the word prevents you from doing things that God does not want you to do. So you may have these subjective feelings like, yeah, I just feel really good about this. I, I, um, I, 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 this makes sense in my life, and I've got a bunch of joy, and I just really, I just really feel like the guy is telling me that I need to you know, become a Mormon. And uh, I said, yeah, mm. yeah, go biblical so that you don't go wrong. Uh, because you can't just go with the subjective realities or the subjective feelings. Um, so negatively, God's word protects you from doing something that is contrary to God. Positively speaking, God's word provides clarity on what we should do. It doesn't just protect us, it also provides clarity. Guidance, it does it in a very general sense, in the, in the sense that it provides principles for how we ought to live. And generally speaking, don't lie, don't um, commit adultery, don't you know, love people, give mercy. Do love people, <laughs> give mercy. Uh, I switched. I went from negative to positive. Um, it gives us it gives us general principles on how to how to how to live. Be fair uh, in your dealings, but it also what I think mainly what I'm referring to here is that through the Word of God, I think you can get actually pretty specific guidance from God. And that there are times when, when you're in the Word and you're wrestling with some question in your life and God seems to speak just so precisely. Like those times when you're reading the Word and you're, you're asking this question and you come to a passage and it's, and it's like the words stand up off the page. And you're like, man, I just know God is, I just know God is speaking to me right now. I remember the way that God used Ezekiel chapter 16 in my life to speak to me very personally about the love of a bridegroom for his bride. In, in chapter 16, God is the bridegroom of his bride Israel, and he rescues her and loves her and cares for her and provides for her and serves her. 
And it just hit me like a train as I was reading it because I was seeking uh, the Lord regarding this question of whether, whether or not I, sh I should pursue a, a relationship with this woman named Amy Lucia Peterson at the time. And, uh, and this, this passage was used powerfully in my life by God to teach me about the love of a, of a husband for his wife and the, and the servant the servant care. And it just was the right word at the right time. And I was like, man, I think this was the Lord. I think this is the Lord giving me some affirmation in the things I'm seeking him about. So, um, does God provide any clarity for your situation through his word? Here's a fifth, here's a fifth principle. Um, God often provides guidance through godly counsel. Not only does he give us his word, but he gives us people through whom he provides counsel. Proverbs 20:18. Plans are established by counsel, by wise guidance, wage for. Talk to somebody first. Get some in input on this before you make your decision. If you want clarity about what, what God's will is for your life, make sure you're reading God's word and make sure you ask some godly people what they think about it. What's, what, is, what is their perspective? Talk with a mentor. Talk with a pastor. Talk with a, a small group leader, if you've got small groups. Uh, talk to a trusted friend. Now, if you're, if you're married, what does your spouse think? I think that's probably the most important counsel uh, in a marital relationship. Is, is, your, is your spouse on board with this? Um, if your parents love Jesus, what do, you, what do your parents think about this? Seeking counsel. Now, this is different than seeking permission. I'm not saying you need to seek uh, permission from your uh, parents, you know, unless you're still under their authority. But uh, the point is God loves to use other people to help you see clearly because it puts you in a place of humility where you're going to <coughs> other people and asking what their opinion is. Um, if you're like me, you would probably rather hear your own opinions than anybody else's opinion, and that's why it's good for us to make sure that we, as a matter of discipline, give other people the opportunity to speak into the situation. I've made some really stupid mistakes by not doing this. I, I, I uh, led a ministry down in New Mexico, part of the ministry that Ashley was a part of, and some other folks that are here tonight. Um, and I, it was a very fruitful ministry, and I decided to, um, leave that ministry to go play in a band. And I didn't really ask anybody if they thought it was a good idea. I just kind of announced that this is what I was going to do. And um, it, was, it was this cool band. They were used to touring and recording an album. And I was like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. I'm out, you know, peace. And it was, a, it was a really bad idea. And I wish that I had just sought some counsel because I think it was probably the wrong decision. Uh, although God is so good because if it weren't for that, I don't think I would have met anybody. So. You know, it, he's, he's masterful. Um, yeah, seeking counsel. Um, here's the thing with counsel as well. You'll probably hear different different things from different people, which can make seeking counsel um, a little bit confusing. Oftentimes, you're going to receive conflicting counsel. Perhaps two wise bits of information, both of them coming from godly people, advising you to do two different things. So when I was trying to decide whether or not to marry Amy, um, I felt, uh, well, it was kind of like, okay, boom, loose ends, check. Did God initiate this or did I initiate it? Uh, totally God. This was not my plan. Check. Um, joy, double check. Uh, as in, I had lots of joy. Right? Um, God seems to be speaking to me through His Word, so I talked to some friends. What do you guys What do you guys think about this? And um, some of my friends thought it was a great idea. Some of them thought it was a bad idea, not because of her, but because of my own kind of my own lack of health in my life at that time. Uh, so, so what do you do? What do you do? You have to lean on some of these other principles is God speaking in other ways to help to help you to help maybe indicate which which counsel here is the best counsel for your specific situation does the counsel make sense of some of the other things that God is indicating to help put pieces together um, so like I said 
I, I don't think you want to use any one of these things as your go-to in seeking the Lord's will. I think you want to combine them. Um, and through all of these, I think it helps to put the puzzle together. Here's the last principle, principle number six. God's will enhances our relationship with God. When you're tracking with what God wants for you, it enhances your relationship with God. That, that, that's, that's one of the uh, things that tends to happen. It's an indicator that you're in tune with God's guidance because what you're doing is in line with Him and it ought to be bringing you closer to Him and ought to therefore be producing fruit in your life. If you're doing something that you believe to be God's will, but it's dragging you away from Jesus Christ, it's not God's will. Right? That, 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 doesn't, that doesn't make sense. You, you need to look under the hood and figure out what's going on. If, on the other hand, you're doing something, you're pursuing something that you seem to think God is bringing into your life, and it's drawing you closer to Jesus, and it's producing <coughs> godliness in your life, well, that can be a, an indication that maybe this is a good thing. Because if God is the one who initiated it, and if God is tying together the loose ends, and if he's giving you a genuine, joyful peace through the Holy Spirit, and if he's speaking to you through the scriptures, and if godly counsel is pointing in that direction, um, then it seems that if you start moving in this direction, all of those things will add up to... Yeah, this is God, and it's bringing you in alignment with Him. So, you should smell like Jesus. Maybe, oh, maybe that, maybe that could be the title of the sermon. Sometimes I come into the sermons that don't have a title. You should, you should smell like Jesus. No, that would only make no. sense if that was. No? <laughs> so I was like, no. Okay, so does it resolve loose ends? Does it resolve loose ends? Um, is it clear that God is the initiator? Do you have joy and peace? What does the Bible have to say? What does godly counsel have to say? Are you growing, growing closer to God as a result? Those are six things that I think are reliable tips for tuning into God's will for your life. And um, I, this, this stuff is super practical. I don't know what your situation might be, but um, these, these things have been very helpful for me. Um, and some of them are subjective. Some of them are a little more ob objective. Um, I think they will help you put the pieces together.